Here we go. Uh, yeah, so let's quickly go through. Uh, what are we covering today? Uh, a short intro. Uh, covering the Raspberry Pi for imaging. Uh, I use a software called ECOS. So I'll quickly walk you through it and talk you through how you can go about capturing images, focusing, all that kind of stuff. And then last but not the least, uh, I think Keith, you wanted some coverage on the ASI 224. So brief discussion on that one as well. Uh, quick run through, we bought the telescope way back in 2012. It was originally bought for my daughter because uh, she was showing interest and then it became my hobby. So that's how it started. Joined the club in Feb, got the HEQ5 in June, second hand and then purchase the camera. So really all my photography stuff actually started after I bought this camera. Before that, I used to try and do it with my uh, phone and all sorts of things because I don't own a DSLR. So never got around to doing any of that stuff. And then lastly, I purchased the Raspberry Pi in 2021, April. So uh, what is my kit? Uh, I've got the Astromaster 130EQ, that's the OTA. Uh, it's on the HEQ5. I've got the camera. Uh, it's an old laptop on which I couldn't run uh, Windows 7 any longer. It was so old. Uh, I run Linux on it at the moment. It works fine. Uh, software is KSTAR and ECOS, Cyril and YIM, and then the Raspberry Pi, uh, I've got the 4B with 4 GB RAM and uh, 64 GB SD card. Uh, that's my quick run through of my journey so far. Uh, this is my first image, and then soon followed with that one. Uh, and so on and so forth. So uh, this one was, first one was literally five seconds, probably about a hundred subs. And the later ones are more like 30 seconds to 40 seconds, thereabouts. Uh, coming to using the Pi, right? So the simplest way to use the Pi is the way I've shown it here. Right, so you run, uh, you could run Astroberry or whatever. Uh, and then it's got the K stars preloaded if you're using Astroberry. So you can run K stars and ECOS on that one. Basically, it comes with its own uh, Wi Fi. So you can basically connect to your home router. Uh, connect your laptop, phone, or iPad on this side to your router, and you can hook into this one. And you can either use VMC to see and control this thing, or you can just, it's pre-configured to respond to as a web server. So you can just give its IP address and you'll get a lovely page. You can basically connect to it. That's the easiest way. Uh, what do I do? Uh, the next obvious step is not use the Wi-Fi connectivity, use an ethernet. You could still do the same. If assuming the distance between uh, your laptop and this one is too far or your Raspberry Pi can't reach your home network, then yeah, this would be uh, another option. Uh, as you can see here, all the grunt work is being done on the Raspberry Pi. 
So your uh, laptop or handheld device is just doing a screen capture effectively. So if you feel that people, several people run it this way, I'm not saying no, but what is recommended is this. So you basically run KSTARS or ECOS on your laptop or tablet or whatever it is. And only make use of the indie server on the Raspberry Pi. So then most of the grunt work is being done here on the laptop. And this is only doing the indie server and it's got the drivers to control your mount and uh, other devices to which you attach to it. Any questions on this one so far? Which no? of you found the most reliable? Uh, I, if, use if, this, if you I use, use this configuration. So yeah, thanks. Because my ethernet cable is about 20 meters. So I can literally drag it out of my home and put my scope in whichever corner of the garden I wish to. That's, that's why I opted for this in the first place. Because earlier, when I first started, I used to have two cables basically running from my laptop. So the standard connectivity to the HEQ5, the FTDI or whatever that is, and then uh, another USB that ran to the camera. Then obviously the distance was limited. I either had to buy a powered USB hub and then do it that way, and which is why I said I might as well go for the Raspberry Pi because by then I had seen ECOS, I knew I liked it. And so I said Raspberry Pi suits me very well. How do you um, weatherproof your Raspberry Pi? Uh, I don't have to at the moment because uh, it's not staying there for too long, isn't it? I have to move my mount out every night. Oh, right. No, I mean, so your Raspberry Pi is still on the mount or near yes, this telescope. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So if it's a heavy due night, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. At the moment, it's good. Okay. Stay quite warm. They generate a lot of, a reasonable amount of heat. So um, yeah. because they've not got a huge yeah. uh, heat sink in them, then yeah. uh, inside the case, uh, they don't chew up. Yeah, and mine has got a plastic case as well. So yeah. I'm guessing it won't do up as much as a metal case. So mm -hmm. at the moment, I think I'm good. Does it have to be a, a um, four standard pie or could you get away with a 3B plus? Uh, I think you can run a 3B plus. The four is, uh, it's only 50 quid uh, mil. So mm. no, it's just, I have a, 4B plus, I don't, uh, 3B plus, I'm going yeah, 4. I think, so I think it should be good enough, especially question. if you're running this configuration, yeah. where you're just running the Indie server, mm -hmm. it should run without a problem. Yeah. Coming! Sorry about that. <laughs> are you, um, Pramod, are you connected directly via the Ethernet cable to your laptop, or does the Ethernet cable run to the home network and then the laptop no, connects? No, no, direct. So it's on a separate domain to the home network. I'll show you. I'll show you how it's connected. The only reason why I ask for is that some software, if you're doing things like framing to set up sequences, need internet access. Uh, um, yeah, normally... the internet access is all here, you see. It's going from my laptop to my home network. I don't need internet access here. Yeah, that's I what I'm asking. Is it, is, it on a, is, it on a separate, is it on a separate domain, subdomain within the home, or is it on the same network as your home network? Uh, at the moment, it's a subdomain, so it's okay. it's a different. Uh, yeah. These two yeah. IPs okay. are a separate one. Yeah. But okay. yes, you could pro I think put them on the same domain as your. Uh... Yeah. Yeah, I pretty much do the same. I run an a long Ethernet cable from the dome at the bottom of the garden, but it's connected to a switch mm. on, on the router, which is the same the same network because there's yeah. a dependency yeah. there to be able to interrogate the internet, mm. framing, etc. Yeah. No, I don't need that because all that is done here. Yeah, okay. And I'm good. 
I've got a, I've got a similar setup, Pramod, um, and I've been fairly successful on on Wi-Fi, but mm -hmm. Ethernet, nothing at the moment. <laughs> So yes, that's, a, that's a bit of a challenge, uh, Michael. Yeah. yeah, it is a bit of a challenge because I struggled, right? So I, it's the addressing, I, I I'm no, yes, it's the addressing. I had to do a lot of Googling to figure it out. And then I've sort of uh, tweaked it at the moment. I've literally noted down every single command and step that I had to do. And I've saved it because in case I forget, I'm in deep trouble. Fortunately, the Wi-Fi will do about 30 feet, so um, yeah. not, too, not too bad there. Yeah, Wi-Fi is all right, so yeah. So uh, coming to your options, right? So you can uh, install something like the AstroBerry server, which is effectively the Raspbian and a whole host of uh, astro astronomy-related software. It comes pre-packaged, so you can just download this thing and flush it and job's done. Uh, you can also purchase the Stellarmate OS. I think it's about $49, $50. So that's the other option. Uh, or you can buy the Stellarmate Plus, which is basically the OS and a few other uh, niceties already pre-built on a Raspberry Pi. That's about, I think, $250 or so. Uh, incidentally, these two are written and maintained by the lead programmer of uh, uh, KSTARS and ECOS. So they're well uh, up to scratch. Uh, last but not the least, you can do the from scratch, you can load the Raspbian, you can do all the little bits and bobs. Uh, these two usage options I've already talked about. So that's how you could do it. Uh, how would you go about building the Pi if you want to do it uh, the AstroBerry server route? Simple, get the AstroBerry server from uh, this IP address or this URL, uh, flash your micro SD card. Just double check that your laptop or whatever it is has got a card reader. Uh, if not, you're gonna be in trouble. Uh, and then just take the SD card, put it into the Raspberry Pi and boot. That's it. Uh, it automatically spawns a nice little Wi-Fi with the name of AstroBerry. You just connect to it using the browser, configure it, connect it to your home Wi-Fi, set the geographic location. That's it, done. Any questions on this one? No. Right, Michael, I guess this is useful for you. And Nigel, I think this is the question you were asking, right? It's looking promising. Yeah. So this is roughly my configuration, right? So these two, when they connect, they are picking up uh, an IP from my router by DHCP. So every time they might get a different IP. So this fellow down here is on a separate IP address, which is pre-configured at this end and at that end. So I know when it connects, it will always have those two IP addresses and it will work every time. These are all, uh, I think what are called, someone who has more networking knowledge can tell you this, I think these are called private IP addresses. So they are not visible on the internet. So this is all local to you. Any questions on this one? No. 
Perfect. Right. So let's get on to K stars and ECOS, is which is what I used to do all this stuff, right? So uh, K stars is a planetarium program, just like uh, Stellarium, Sky Chart, all those things. And then it's available on Windows, Mac, and Linux. No problem. ECOS is a observatory control automation tool with, uh, as it says, particular focus on astrophotography. ECOS is bundled with K-Stars. You can't disconnect it. It comes as part and parcel of K-Stars. It's tightly integrated. I think there are talks of unbundling it, but so far, nothing. Uh, it's a free GPL license, source code is all available. You can update it, do whatever you want with it. It's open source. Everything is open source. Uh, indie server, that's the only catch you have, which is unfortunately, it does not run on the Windows platform. Not at the moment. So as soon as you use this combination, you're stuck using either a Linux. So you could have your laptop running Linux or it could be the Mac, like what I've got. I'm at the moment displaying on a Mac. I've got KSTAR's ECOS running here. Indie server happily runs on this. So if you're a Mac user, you can straight away use it. No need of the Raspberry Pi. You can simply connect straight to your devices using the USB hub or whatever it is, and it'll run. Have you, um, Premod, have you thought about running a Linux virtual machine on a Windows platform? Or oh, not thought about it, but have you actually tried it or considered it? Not me. I haven't because okay. my yeah. work laptop, which I'm using at the moment, is a Mac. <clears throat> yeah. My uh, home laptop is a Linux machine, like I mentioned. It's probably an interesting exercise to see how it would, you know, navigate the hardware. I've run VMs, I've, I have run Linux VMs on a Windows machine, and, mm. and I know sometimes this, there can be some issues with hardware, but yeah. I'm curious, because then that will give us a, an opportunity then to try things like yeah, these, I think, these platforms. I think people a, have used it. Yeah, yeah. I have okay. heard of people who have run virtual machines and been using it. Right. Yeah, yeah. So it works, but I don't know how easy or difficult it is to configure. It's just if once you've got the VM in, VMs are fairly straightforward. Once you've got the yeah. VM installed, and then I guess it's yeah. just a simple case of installing these these tools onto the platform. Yeah, probably. Just an opportunity to give the Windows guys a, a, a chance to play around with some of these some of these free softwares packages. Uh, yeah, no, no, you can play around with KSTAS. Mm. Mm. So that's not the problem. It's just you can play around with it on a Windows because yeah. it's available on Windows. Okay. It's just that as soon as you talk about connecting to the indie server and so on, that's yeah. when it can't do it. Okay. So you can't practice the ECOS part of it. To be fair, most people have probably got Raspberry Pis. I know I've got a drawful from And somewhere. most a lot of people have the Mac. So. Yeah. Oh well I don't well yeah. <laughs> I've never had a Mac, <laughs> but then I don't qualify as most people, I guess. Yeah. <coughs> I've, never, I've never had a Mac either. <laughs> it's not that I don't believe in Macs. It's, I've just never had a problem yeah. with Windows. And if I had to go down the Mac route, um, I'll tend to use a, 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 a Linux VM, which is a similar OS. Yeah, which is what I've done, right? I've basically loaded Linux on my yeah, laptop. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I think for the promote earlier points, the, the the fact that the, uh, the the Raspberry Pi four it's only about fifty quid and you've got a little dedicated thing that's uh, probably less heartache than trying to do the yeah the that's, you're, that's exactly it yeah you're right yeah point of least path of least resistance <laughs> yeah. yeah fifty quid Astroberry server is free K stars is free Ecos is free what more do you want it's just just got to figure out how to get it connected to the yeah, network. That's it. That's it. <laughs> yeah. Pretty much. Well, the Wi Fi works a treat, you know, to start with and then figure your network afterwards. Yeah. So, uh, why ECOS, right? So, what does it have? Uh, you can control the mount, camera, filter wheels, focuser, guider, dome, and any other indie compatible 
device. If you go on their website, you'll see hundreds of these. Uh, it's I think indielib.org or some such name. But if you go there, you'll see the number of devices that they support. I was surprised because uh, you know people keep talking about this SV Boni or whatever. How I, I don't know how you say it. S V B O N Y. They've introduced a new camera, Astro camera. And last week I saw someone had written a driver for it. It's there. I don't know how many users are there worldwide for who would use that camera, but you've got a driver for it. Yeah, it's there. It's got, uh, you can schedule and automate uh, sessions based on constraints. Uh, it's got a built-in auto guiding, or if you're not happy with that one, you can always hook it up to PhD2. It will work with that. Plate solving, built-in option, or you can use external solvers. It works with astrometry, ASTAP. Uh, you've got the focus modes. You can do auto or a manual focus. You can ask it to build mosaics. So it will schedule and move the camera around your object, take pictures, and then save it separately. Uh, Meridian flip automatic. Uh, it help, can help you calibrate your flat frames. And then last but not the least, You've got a planner, which uh, you can use for both. Even if you don't have a camera, no astrophotography, that kind of stuff, you can use it for planning your visual. And if you want to do imaging, obviously it's got all the tools. So you can literally plan and schedule your visual uh, viewings. You can keep notes. Uh, so there's a whole bunch of little stuff in there, which I like. Can I ask um, um, Pramad, where if you've got uh, connectivity to uh, PDT, um, PhD2, and it, that implies it's, it's an ASCOM compliant um, uh, system? No, it's Indy, Indy server. Oh, Indy it's, it's, it's the uh, Indy connectivity into PhD2. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. Point. It's got the Indy connectivity to Pix Insight. It's got the Indy connectivity to. Right. Yeah, okay. A whole bunch of those things, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, what's my workflow, right? So I basically polar align using the polar scope, which is fortunately there on my mount. I basically start up ECOS and the Indy server kicks off and it connects to the devices on the R5. Uh, I do a manual focus. Uh, here's a tip. Obviously, at that point, your laptop is in your home or and you are next to the telescope. So you're not going to be able to see the screen of your laptop. So the way I do it is I've got team you are running on my phone, which I connect to my laptop so I can see its screen. And then I twiddle the knobs until I can see it, the focus is achieved on ECOS on my home screen. I'm sure there's other ways to do it, but that's how I do it. Uh, there is a polar alignment tool in ECOS. So it basically takes a set of photographs by rotating the mount. It takes literally three sets of photographs by rotating mount, finds out what's the it does a plate solving at each point, figures out where exactly your mount is rotating around, and then gives you two lovely arrows saying correct in this direction and that direction, and it, you bring it back to an accurate polar alignment. I think even SharpCap does something similar, uh, so you can do it that as well. Uh, you can do mount alignment. Obviously, if uh, it give you better go-to results, then you can capture images, create sequences, and so on. 
Uh, we'll cover that more. I think Keith was interested in the sequences. Uh, and then obviously you can run the scheduler and then just put your feet up. Right, so I'll quickly take you through ECOS. Uh, a brief introduction to the interface, uh, framing and we'll cover framing and plate solving, uh, capturing images, scheduling, and if time permits, then we can cover off the other three details here. That sound like a plan? Mm -hmm. Ah, coming to ECOS. Right. That's what K stars looks like. Very similar to uh, Stellarium and all other tools. Similar interface. Uh, in here, you can see it's got the standard controls. You can, uh, what I haven't done is you can get the background or the lovely image, or you can just do it with standard stuff. Uh, and this is basically ECOS, that little control there. So you can see what I've got here is basically I've launched the following, right? So I've got the CCD. So for each of your devices, it basically opens a little tab. So if I had a dome and I launched the dome, the dome would get its own little tab here. So what I've got here is uh, something to capture, something to focus. And this is your mount control. This is the alignment. And then this is the guiding control. So it's pretty simple. So any questions so far? Excellent. By CCD, presumably they just mean camera. Yeah, it's just a camera. Depends on what you've got. I've, I've used simulators here, so. Yeah, I use my uh, Nikon camera with mine. Mm -hmm. So the focuser is uh, plain and simple, right? So you can capture an image and you can see on the screen here, it automatically identifies a star because I've asked it to auto select a star. Let me zoom this out. Is that more visible? Mm -hmm. So yeah, so I've asked it to auto select the star. So basically it automatically selects it. If I don't, I have the option. So I do that again. So it's taken a picture of where I'm located on the screen or where I'm pointed to identifies the various stars that it can find and it assigns a HFR to each of them, right? So once you've isolated a star that you wish to, and if I do an auto select, it obviously will pick a star and if I say subframe it, like I did before, you'll get is it gone? There. So this is the way to simply do it, right? So you've got it saying 2.98, you go out there, you twiddle the knobs until this number keeps going down and down. And if I had an autofocuser, it would have been straightforward, right? So if I press that button, it would have controlled the focuser and you can see it's attempting to focus here and you should get a lovely curve and it should stop when it's got the lowest value. But 
but this being a simulator doesn't always do the job. But it's as simple as that. So in our case, if it's manual, right? So you basically set it there, twiddle the knob until you get a smallest value that you can achieve. So is that, a, is that a live stream or is that, or do you have to press the go button every time to capture an image? Uh, no, you can press this and it'll keep capturing an image. Right, so you can do it live, so to speak. Yeah, you can do it live. It'll keep capturing one after the other. If you've got a Bartino mask, you can say what you want it to do, you can You can effectively say, you can fiddle with all these things. You can give it the mask. And once you've set the mask, it basically, uh, what it does is you'll get the three lines and it will give you a one, one center line will be, uh, I think green in color. The two extreme lines are red. And then you can you can see the values as it moves. So that's uh, another way to do it. So that's focusing. Any questions? Does it? I can see you've got a reference there to filters. It says luminance. I guess that's obviously where you select your filters. Yeah, you can. Uh, yeah, and then I guess it saves the um, the filter level. Sorry, the focus. The focus. Oh. Offset, yeah, yeah for I, each of the I, filters. I haven't tried this uh, to that level, Nigel, but I think it does. Yeah, I think it really only applies if you've got an automatic focuser, to be yeah. fair. Mm. And I don't have filters either, so I haven't <laughs> really tried out each of uh, these. And a mono camera, of course. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. I'm dying to buy that uh, Optolong. Uh, L enhance and see what to do with it. So once I do that, yes, I'll tell you how to work this piece. <laughs> right, coming to the capture piece, right? Uh, let me cover off alignment before we come to capture quickly. Okay, so this is basically what I've done is I've got my telescope somewhere here, right? So you can basically point to anything, say, go there. So you've got Deneb in this case. You go to your capture or align and you say capture and solve. So it will capture an image, obviously in this case, it's screaming, it's saying, I can't find enough stars, but what will happen is this, in effect, what it should do is um, give you a plot here as it goes and it will get closer and closer. And then it will say, yeah, it's within tolerance within this green circle, it will stop. If you've got an image previously that you have, which is pretty useful, especially if you're uh, taking pictures and you've stopped midway through somewhere. So you save the last picture, ask it to load that picture here, and it will slew your telescope to that exact same spot and leave it there. It's really handy when you've aborted halfway through between some image capture and you've been doing a mosaic or whatever it is, or yep. you've got this weird piece of sky, you don't know where it is from, you haven't recorded it, then you can do it this way. I guess before it can, before it goes and it, it's not gonna, it's gonna go off to that location, isn't it? And then it's gonna plate itself to make sure it's located it accurately. Correct, correct. Yeah, yeah. Does it use third party plate solvers or um, similar to SUP or does it, has it just it, got a built in plate It's solver? got a built in one. It's got. Oh, here we go. Yeah. 
at the moment it's set to the internal solver you can use there we go yeah step local yeah. astrometry you can use astap you can use online yeah, good old desktop yeah you've got a whole bunch of options here for the configurations for it uh, and assuming you have to put your field of view and everything Sorry, focal length. You have to put your focal length and field of view in, I guess. I couldn't see that. Uh, in order for it to play itself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think that, that would probably go in under the telescope settings, wouldn't it? Yeah. And then it, and then it cross references Correct. it. Yeah. Correct. And once you've done that, right, so you've got the index files, right? So based on your, uh, if you're doing it uh, offline, so based on your... Uh, FOB, right, it will recommend which index mm. files are required, which are optional, and which you don't need, and so on. So you can download those alone. So it's neat. Well, so that's uh, that bit. So coming to the capture bit, how are we doing for time? Okay, uh, so the capture is simple. Uh, you've got your exposure here of uh, in seconds. Uh, you've got the count. So how many of those you want? You choose your filter. Uh, if, the, if you want a delay between images, you can set the delay. Uh, the format in which you want to save it. Uh, you've got here you can choose light, bias, dark, flats, and so on. If you say flats, then it allows you to calibrate. So you can say how you want to do it. Is it manual? Is it dust cover with built-in flat light? If that's controlled, then it can operate it for you. Uh, and all those lovely things. Uh, and then you've got this option, obviously, so which is you choose an ADU, you can calculate it. Uh, people like uh, Mildev gave me the magic number. I just popped it in there and I say, okay. And then off I go, I say, click the picture. It automatically adjusts the exposure and everything else to suit and it'll take a flat. That's it. It's fairly simple. And then now, uh, obviously, as soon as you've selected, uh, this I think answers your question, Keith. So you've got your pixel sizes of my camera, of the ASI, I've configured it. Mm -hmm. So it's basically, that's the pixel size. You can choose a binning, uh, you can choose a gain whatever it is that your camera supports. You can choose an offset if you have one. Uh, and then, so based on what you have selected, automatically it sets, gives you the file name. So in my case, it was Deneb, which is where it was pointed to. So it gives me Deneb. And then you can, post picks, you can attach the name of your filter, the duration or timestamp and so on. And what I was saying before, right? So you can, if you've got the guider working, then you can say that only take pictures if blah, blah, if it's within that tolerance. Uh, same for focus. You can force it to autofocus. Mm -hmm. if it's outside those tolerance. And in terms of when you've connected it to the Raspberry Pi, you can say, save it remotely, that is on the Raspberry Pi. I would not recommend that at the moment because the scheduler is not very good at handling remotely stored images. Uh, or you could say both which means it saves locally and on the pipe. 
or you can just save locally, which means it just saves on your laptop. <clears throat> uh, coming to the sequences itself, it's simple, right? So let's say you want to take a series of images, right? So you want five sets of uh, luminance once, 10 of alpha, and you want to close it off with 10 darks. So you basically put, you just configure it here on the left-hand side, press the plus sign, it will add a row here. That's it, it's as simple as that. So this becomes your sequence, right? So if you press this button here, you start the sequence. So effectively it will go off. It will start capturing five of these. It will change the filter, put your edge alpha filter, take 10 of those, and then it will if you put the cap on, it will put the cap, take the ducks. Quick question there, Pramod. Yeah. Can it be set so instead of taking the five, do, doing them uh, each step mm -hmm. on completion, can you do step one, two, three, then back to step one, two, three? Uh, I haven't tried it. Because I think that's an option, correct me if I remember, probably Mill Dave will remember in SG Pro. You can get that's your sequence awesome. to either run the four. Yeah, you can. You can do them, you can rotate round or complete each event, as it were. Because in SG Pro they're they're deemed events, so each each batch. Mm. Um, so yeah, you can do either either option. Yeah, if you want to do it in a batch that way, uh, you can do it in the scheduler, right? So you can save each of these as a separate sequence, and then so you have one image of these, and then you can come to the scheduler, and you basically just save this as a sequence. And so it's in my case, you can see I've saved it as a demo dot sequence. And then you just come to the scheduler and you say, what's the object that you want to take a picture of? So it's that, you say, okay. Then, so it automatically picks up the RA and the deck and all that stuff. So you say, what's the sequence? You pick up the sequence and you just say, so in my case, I've said, repeat it for two runs. Yeah. yeah. You just click it. So it starts scheduling. So it ends up with 50 of those images because each of that se those sequences has got 25 each, right? Including ducks. Mm -hmm. So it would do it that way. So in the, case you were talking about, you would have three lines here, effectively, in which case it would run through the three lines. You could, I think, do it that way. You saved, uh, you saved those three um, those three lines as a sequence, didn't you? And now what you're doing here, yeah. you're, you're basically yeah. re replaying that sequence yeah. multiple Replay times. Replay the sequence. Yeah, so you, that's, that's basically answered the question, hasn't it? Yeah, I think you can do it which is the other way around. I'm not sure because I've, I've never had to do it that way. It was just on that other screen. I think it's a, there's a pull down in SG Pro that allows you to choose, you know, set it there, which... Uh, mm. There so, may be an option here as well, Bob, but, uh, because yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I think, no, thought I was asking the question then. Thanks. Yeah. Um, Paramount, do you know, is it, is it doing a uh, plate solver on, on every image? Or could you, you put can a schedule it here? So you, you can, can put say, a schedule in to say, yeah, you yeah. can say track it, do a focus, okay, do an align. So for each row here, right, mm -hmm. it will do this. Okay. Is that so? If, so if you had, to, let's say, you were doing a mosaic, and you were doing, let's say, for example, a sequence that you just saved of those three sets. Mm -hmm. three fil filters on the previous screen you had 10 10 yeah. and 5 that's 25 yeah you've told this now to repeat that sequence times two runs which obviously is what gives us our 50 captures correct 
Now that's of one part of the sky. Now if you were doing a mosaic and you moved on to another part of the sky, Correct. normally you would only want to re um, plate solve. Correct. So at, if at you do a point, mosaic, right, this is what it will do, right? So this is the way to create a mosaic. So you say, I yeah. want six by six. It creates that mosaic. And then as soon as you save it, it creates separate sets of sequences for each of these. Yeah, I think what I'm yes, that's right. And what I'm I think what I'm trying to say here is that you would only normally play. So you'll solve. end up with six lines here. Correct. But you'd only play solve between the lines, not between the sequ not between the um captures within the lines. So each yes. line at the moment currently represents three filters correct. that we were using your previous example. Correct, correct. And normally you would you would you would you would refocus on a filter by filter basis typically. No, that it anyway does, which is what I said, right? So if it's filter by filter basis, you can say that automatically when it's uh, yeah. doing it, you can ask it to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What I'm trying to say though is that we focus, don't refocus. Well, I think what I'm saying here is that if you look on your, if you go back to the camera screen where you had the plate solve, yeah. Um, where was the plate? Solve? Sorry, this screen here. So you've only got where you've got a line. I presume a line means plate solve. Now, what I'm saying is no, that that's that is only in certain conditions, Nigel. Right. So this is I'm forcing a plate solve. Yeah. Right. right? So, yeah, yeah. Whereas. Some of these conditions, you can force it to plate solve if certain parameters are not met. So if it's not in focus, it's let not. Me, let me put it another way. What, if you, so on, you can force it to plate solve. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, what I'm saying. Let's say you've got three, you've got three sequences scheduled, but you yeah. only want to plate solve on the second sequence. How yeah. do you turn it off for the first and third I sequence? Don't know. I haven't gone to that level of, you're asking okay. me very, very detailed questions on how to use this. <laughs> Sorry. You'll have to ask someone who's expert and who's okay. been doing this day in day out. Yeah, yeah, I yeah, use no, it for, for simple purposes. <laughs> no, no, sure no. I know <laughs> what my limitations are. <laughs> okay. If there is a way around, I know you can write scripts. The reason why, yeah, and, and the things. I don't know what all, and people use it for all sorts of things. Yeah, so yeah, I'm yeah. guessing I mean, there's it, a way, way around. It's in, it's, it was an interesting point because that's why I asked the question about the mosaics because normally with STP, for example, you would only plate solve when you move the scope onto the new onto another frame, which is another yeah. sequence. You know, so if you did a, fro, a four panel mosaic, for example, you would have four sequences listed here, right. and then you would only align as you move to the new sequence. But you've only got one setting for a line on the left. So the implication of that it's inferring that when you select a line, it's going to align for everything regardless. Or is that aligning? Is that aligning per sequence? Per sequence, or is that aligning per per um, sequence? Sub, it is per, per sequence. Right, okay. Per right, sequence. Right, okay, that answers the question. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that. So, it's which right. is what I end up doing, right? So, right, in yeah. my case, it's typically it's just this, right? So, I don't have these two. So it's something like this. Gotcha. Yeah. Right. And then I save it as a sequence and off it comes here. And I I don't have a autofocuser, I don't have a guide. So my typical one is I set it to track, I set it to align. So end of every sequence, which is five images, it will realign. So you can you can compensate for drift here without Correct. having a tracking. Right. Okay. Correct. Correct. Without having auto-tracking or Correct. guidings, rather. Yeah. yeah. So what I've figured is for roughly, because each of mine are 30 seconds, right? So about 10 images or so later, the drift is uh, a bit more than I want it to be. Mm -hmm. So I use typically out here, I use 10 images straight away. Right, so the count is 10 there. Right, and then I save it as a sequence. Then if I load that as a sequence,
So you've got, and the store runs, mm -hmm. right? So at the end of every sequence, which is 10 images, it will realize. Okay, that's a use, that's a useful tip. Yeah, yeah. Because if people aren't doing auto guiding, then um, and they do fairly good polar aligning by mm -hmm. realigning after every group, um, right. you can compensate for any drift or, or misalignment. So good. Yeah. And someone pointed out by doing this effectively, I am dithering as well. Is that right, Milde? Yeah, you are more or less. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you're just, you're just, uh, you're almost doing a um, a natural dither. A, it depends natural, on how good the alignment yeah, is, doesn't it? <laughs> in the in the first ten, you're dithering, and then you're resetting it back. So you're doing yeah. like a sawtooth dither. <laughs> if you if you plotted it, it'd probably look like sawtooth. Alignments aren't perfect either, are they? You're always out oh, of no. a few pictures. You're always so, going to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah. That's interesting then. So it, align, so it aligns per sequence within that scheduler, and Correct. it also aligns per repeat. So when you've got repeat for two, it will align Correct. when this one, yeah, got it. Mm. Okay, understood. Sneaky, I had, sneaky it is, trick. Yeah. <laughs> I had it in my mind that it was it was attempting to realign for every image that you take. It's like, wow, that's crazy. But it's, mm. yeah, it's just late, no, 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 late, late in the evening. <laughs> per sequence, it does. So, yeah, cool. If you haven't got an autofocuser, which I, I think you said you don't. Um, yeah. I can't refocus at the end of every. No, I can't. So, so well, so so the question was going to be: Can, can you, at the end of each run, can, can does it pop up with a with a reminder I saying go out and no refocus? Idea. Or... I okay. have no idea. I have yeah, never in, tried out in SG Pro Promad. That would be the the equivalent of pausing. Mm. Yeah. You pause the sequence, do an auto focus or a manual focus, and then yeah. you start the sequence again. So that's the sort of mechanism. SG Pro uses so there may be yeah. the equivalent there. Yeah, there may be. I don't know what happens when I, you know, say if I told mm. it to focus and it knows I don't have a focuser, will it force me to, you know, will it take me to that module here mm. and say, right, I give you a chance to focus? Well, so I can try it. Yeah, yeah, you'll have to try it, won't you? Be because, because yeah. the other thing is, if you if you change filters, you you should refocus. So you know, can you? Uh, my yeah, question right. next one was, you know, can you then say, prompt me to go and refocus when I change filters, or yeah, can I'm you sure prompt me does. to go and put put the lens cap on when I'm going to about to take darks? Yeah, that it does. Right. Okay. That's, That's useful. It, that it does because I know I've tried it. <laughs> <laughs> filters? No, I haven't. Docs, yes. You try. Uh, are, are you your writing doc, a to-do list down now, then, Promo? To do what? Are you writing your little to-do list, and that's to try that? <laughs> I can't. I don't have a filter. I don't have. No, no. Guides. I mean the focus one. You just the have focus. to put a little note to self. Oh, I must try that. <laughs> yeah, must try that. Yeah. Hmm. We just need what? clear skies for that. That's all. Tomorrow night's forecast clear. Is it? Yep. Yeah, and I've looked on a couple of sites, and they both, <laughs> amazingly, they both agree. Ah. But now you've just jinxed it because you got all our hopes up. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> and obviously, you've got a couple of features here. If you've got the, the weather device, you can link it, and it will automatically take care of it. Uh, if the moon comes too close, it will stop. <laughs> If the altitude is not whatever you've set here, it won't start the sequence at all. Uh, and the useful part is if you're imaging multiple objects in the same night, which I have done, I just put them in order. It will sort them in the order in which they rise. So it will automatically choose the one that's topmost and then go downwards. So yeah, as some nice nifty features hmm. and What's obviously it? for dome controllers and all that stuff you've got the observatory shutdown procedures here you can do a whole bunch of things you can ask it to park the mount park the dome blah blah and so on presumably you can set a uh, set temperature if you've got a cooled ccd or a cooled camera yes you can hmm. 
that guy there. It tells you the current temperature. You can say that's the temperature I want it to do. We've got a whole bunch of lovely stuff there. Great. Does it make the tea? Uh, you can write to your own indie driver for it, I'm sure. There you go. Doing... Sends a message to the wife. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I have to say, all these packages are, are very, very capable nowadays. Yeah. It's not bad for free, is it? No, it's absolutely, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. And then this is another one which I haven't used. The guide, because mm -hmm. it gives you all the lovely things here to show you how much you're in or out of thing. And then you've got a lovely dashboard here, which tells you what has been done, or what is being done. And then it tells you focus. Obviously, I aborted it last time. Gives you those lovely graphs, the guiding graph. And then you've got the stats here. You can maintain and keep track. It will tell you exactly how the pattern of when you took an image, when it was guiding, the aligning bit, the focus, the capture, a whole bunch of little parameters here, which you can, it stores all those in a file. You can load it later and have fun. So yes, there's a lot in there, which I haven't even bothered to look at. It's there. That's ECOS in a nutshell. Guys. What's its um, help file like? You know, support help file. Help file. Uh, Have you found that to be good? Uh, no. The help file, I haven't used it at all. So don't ask me. So it's self-explanatory. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> there are plenty of uh, videos out there. Yeah, There's plenty yeah. of documentation out there. So... Oh, I fine. haven't bothered to go and see the help file because you've got the tool tips which are helpful in a lot of the cases. So yeah, let yeah. me find a tool tip. Mm -hmm. So it gives you a tool tip. So fine. Yeah. That's did, good. Did, did you say the drivers for the things like the cameras, etc., are written by um, the general public or are they written by the camera vendors? Could be any, but it's open source, so. Yeah, I mean, a lot of vendors do contribute yeah. to the open source market. Yeah, they that, probably uh, add to it. I don't know who writes them. It's there. The reason <laughs> That's I'm all I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 just, it's, it's like saying I, the EQ mod driver, right? I don't know who wrote it in the first place. It's hmm. there on ASCOM. It's there for Indy. EQ mod, it's open source, that is. That wasn't, yeah, that's yeah. not. I'm talking about, for example, ZWO writing a driver for an ASCOM. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm pretty sure. You have, so you have more com ZWO, it comes as a package. I don't know who wrote yeah, you it. Have, you have, you have, I, I, I would have more confidence in the support and the driver robustness if it was manufactured or written by the vendor as opposed to, you know, I've run Linux systems in the past and I've had problems with contributed open source drivers for hardware yeah. which you know i don't know where they come from yeah okay no, no, just just a question mate all i know is my driver for the asi works beautifully yeah. okay that's the most important thing isn't it yeah that's it so it's like your mileage may vary say again bob your mileage may vary yeah 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 I guess it depends on how, how new the cameras are. If the ASI 174 has been out a while, then obviously it's going to have you know better support from the general public than, say, a, a new camera that's only been on the market a few weeks or, or months. Uh, Prima, do you know if you can use DSLRs with this? Yes, you can. I think Michael has tried it out. So... Yes, I have. Yes. So, it, so it's got typically Canon and... Yours is Nikon, isn't it, Michael? So yes, Canon, Nikon drivers. There are plenty yes, of also... drivers out there for Canon and Nikon. Okay, that's good to know. When when uh, I'm using the obviously using a Nikon driver, um, and as soon as you link, it actually looks at what the actual model is of your camera, what the pixels are, um, mm. the uh, the field whether you've got it set in um, whatever mode you're in whether your 
lenses, if you've got a lens on, because sometimes I would use it with a lens instead of putting it on the telescope. Mm -hmm. Tells you if it's an autofocus lens and what the focus is and what the uh, zoom is, all sorts of things. It all comes up on the screen. Can you can you autofocus? Yes, DSLR. I, I can with my Nikon. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, it's quite good. Yeah, very interesting. Yeah. Interesting thing I found with the, so, some of my Canon lenses, and it's not all of them, and I keep meaning to make a list is that within the um, backyard EOS, typically to control the lens, it needs to be in manual mode. Yeah, but yeah I'll find that. Lens, but a couple of my lenses actually will work in either autofocus mode or manual mode. Yeah, I found the same. It, it, tends, it prompts you, doesn't it? And it says, go and, can you go and turn it into manual focus? And then when it's focused, it says, can you go back to autofocus? I found okay, well, that. With, yeah. with some of the luxury lenses, it does. You want it to be a man. You don't really want it left in autofocus. Once you've got the focus, you really want the lens to be a manual. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And that's to stop the camera from automatically trying to focus every shot. I guess. Yes. Yeah. 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 And last but not least, I think someone asked me about the EQ mod stuff. So you've got this lovely control. If you so wish to use it. And then you've got all the other controls, which I've already shown you. So that's not actually EQ mod, or is it? No, it's not. No, I no, think EQ is. mod has a control which is similar to this. Looks yeah. like this. Yeah. Okay. yeah, I'll use that with my old as mount. You, you could use it yeah. with any anything you yeah. want, yeah. yeah. I do like the fact you've got a planetarium built into this. We don't have to run it separately. I do like that. Yeah. And yeah, uh, I guess what we need to cover off is framing, isn't it? Uh, yeah, that's going to ask that. So I've got this here, right, at the moment. So there's two ways to do it. Uh, one is you put your, there's a sensor here. So you can, and mm -hmm. it will tell you roughly where it is capturing. Mm -hmm. uh, the other and more accurate way, obviously this one doesn't know your exact rotation, right? Mm -hmm. So, but as soon as you plate solve, what it does, it, it rotates this fellow around to tell you exactly what is the correct direction. So let's try it and see if it plate solves for me. Uh, this one was refusing to do it, isn't it? Let's see if we can go to 206. So it thinks it's there, pointing mm -hmm. this way, right? So if I did a plate solve, let's hope it works. Attempting to correct itself. Last time it didn't work for me with the simulators. So I'm not too sure it's going to do it. But if I just stop this mm -hmm. and you see it's turned itself around. Mm -hmm. So you can 
exactly see what you're going to get. Hmm. So that's the simple way to do it. So quickly take a image and play it solve. Then you can decide whether you want to rotate your camera around, take another one until you've got the image in the right side up. So what was the process again, Pramod, to get this now into a, into a sequence? Uh, From this, now you've framed it and you've rotated yeah. it and you're happy with it. That's it. Nothing to do. You just go to the capture mode and All right, okay. just, just run your sequence because oh, okay. it will. Because obviously nothing's moving, so therefore yeah. It'll, yeah, yeah. Yeah. it'll just capture the image as is. Yeah. Yeah. But it's giving you the, the correct prefix. It's put the prefix NGC underscore two oh six. Yeah. 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 Sorry. Yeah. So that that it does automatically. So another quick question. Yeah. Does it have support for camera rotators? Yes, it does. <laughs> but don't ask me how it works. Oh well, that's that's fine. Just uh... yeah. Don't have one yet, but I uh, know. <laughs> I was going to say, I thought you were going to, I thought you were going to um, bring cloud to us tomorrow I by say. saying you've just got one. Uh, Dave will be selling one soon. <laughs> <laughs> I brought the high winds to us because I got a drone. <laughs> there we go. That's great, Pramod. See if I can uh, bring up. The indie that's the indie page, right? So you've got a whole bunch of stuff for that. Uh, you've got under individuals, you've got devices. So you've got a whole bunch of things there, filter wheels, auxiliary, blah, blah, blah. blah. And this is designed to run on a, 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 a Raspberry Pi, yeah? Uh, yeah, last Raspberry Pi, Mac, uh, Linux. Oh, Linux, yeah, it's okay. A, a, any Linux-based system, isn't it, I guess? Yeah, yeah, yeah. any Linux-based yeah. system, effectively. Well, so I suspect Linux. that uh, as people to move forward to Windows 11, there'll be lots of fairly good spec uh, laptops <laughs> wanting a Linux installation on them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'm thinking there you go. I think that answers your question, DSLR cameras. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a whole bunch of them underneath that. Pramod, did you ever get the wind, that weather interface working? I have curiosity. No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Simple answer. <laughs> so there you go. You've got different drivers for Canon, Nikon, Pentax, Sony, and Fuji. Take your pick. So the weather interface, I guess, is a bit like Nina. It, it, it comes from a global source somewhere. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's the it's bit not a local configuring source. Configuring it to work from that global source, that's what I was yeah. trying. So I... Yeah, I mean the the API. I yeah, write code. So <laughs> yeah, that's, that's fair enough. I was trying to find um, one of the APIs that has got the um, where you don't need to write the code. So basically, you just send the you just you just type in your URL. It will go and do a query on the remote weather server, hmm. um, and then that brings back the text, the the JSON file, and then that JSON file will be parsed out by your your software yep. um, based off the keywords. But I couldn't find one. That's but I'm mean, I'm I'm curious. I might I might I might carry on with it uh, as a challenge and install yeah. this this software. Um, this is what I was talking about, right? So this person. is a fairly new one. I didn't expect someone to. Mm. I had a driver for it. I don't know. Who's, it's, it's I can't answer Nigel's question on who added the driver, but it's there. Yeah. Yeah. I never even heard it. I thought you said SXV. That was um, Starlight Express. But SV, I have no idea. Yeah, SV Boney. I think they're Hong Kong based. They mm. do a range of low cost astronomy equipment. Which, um, which actually gets good write ups for low cost stuff, you know. It's... So I'm guessing because they put the 
a website here that which is, is so of the actual manufacturer. I'm guessing the drivers have come from them. Yeah, yeah I mean, Otherwise, if you go to that website and then, some... and then go to the driver page, it'll, yeah, they'll probably have it as a download. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Hmm. Very good. So that's that. Uh, coming back to my presentation, we haven't covered off everything, have we? Uh, the ASI stuff. So let's shut this down quickly. Simple, disconnect, job done. Uh, where's my presentation? Right, so my imaging settings, right? This is what I was talking about. So I set uh, exposures between 30 and 60 seconds. Gain, I set anywhere between 120 and 240. Uh, reason is simple. If you look at the uh, readme file that came with your ASI 224, mm -hmm. uh, these are the graphs, mm -hmm. right? And you can see here that the read noise drops, starts dropping as soon as you go beyond something like 60. Mm -hmm. So at 120 and 150 and 240, which is roughly where I am, the read noise is pretty low. And this is the guidance that is there in that same readme file. It's not, I didn't cook this up. So this is what it says. It says set the gain lower for higher dynamic range, longer exposures, or set it higher for lower noise, such as short exposure or lucky image. And I simply read this and I said, yeah, that works for me. So a uh, question here for the, for the other guys here. Gain, is that, directly equivalent to ISO. So the higher the gain, it's like high ISO. Yes. Yeah. The problem you got, like it says there though, when as you go up with the gain, the read nose goes down, but you lose the dynamic range. Dynamic range, yes. Um but yes. of course then you need to start thinking about um guiding for the long exposures. Or, or um as primer to doing it, you just take lots and lots and lots of short subs. Um, and try to get the dynamic range through, you know, through through a large set of subs. Mm. I think it's quite a controversial thing because you, depending on who you talk to, some people will say, you know, the longer the exposure, the better, because you're going to pull in fine detail, which you don't stand a chance of catching with like a 30 second exposure, no matter how many subs you do. But then, you know, I've spoken to other people which said, well, no, it's the signals there. It's just very difficult to detect and you need a lot of subs to get it. Um, and I've never actually sat down and, and done the exercise to compare the two, but... Well, that was the point that uh, John Murphy was making in his recent presentation about shot noise. Correct, yeah. correct. But uh, it, it is there, it's just you need lots and lots of exposures. Yeah, there you go, yeah. Make, make use yeah. of it, yeah. yeah. Hmm. So the shorter the exposure, the more of them you need. Yeah. Correct. Yeah, okay. it's the total number of photons, so it, it's the yeah. total number of minutes or hours of, of exposure that's important mm -hmm. um wh whether you split that into shorter subs or longer subs it, it's kind of up to you the, the other thing you need to be careful of is not to take too long a sub so that all the stars get completely overexposed and you and they all end up looking white um mm -hmm. or or it or bloated um mm -hmm. so so one of the reasons i take very short exposures is if i don't um, then all my stars end up looking white and I've lost all the star colour. Absolutely, and you run the risk of capturing satellite trails, aeroplanes. Yeah, but yeah, um, the longer you expose, the more junk there is out there that's going to ruin your picture. Exactly, and you might be nine minutes into a 10-minute sub and you accidentally knock your mount <laughs> and you're not going to be a happy chappy. But, but <laughs> what, do we call, what do we call a long exposure? <laughs> three, um, three, 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 three
seconds or for me anything that's like for me anything over three minutes up this is a personal i think it's a personal yeah. uh, uh yeah a decision but for me five minutes is a long exposure 10 minutes and 20 minutes so i've done five 10 and 20 and even 30 minute exposures 30 minutes is the extreme um but yeah five to ten for me is a long exposure anything from three minutes and below is is, is reasonably short but i guess you could argue that um a short exposure is an exposure that doesn't give you star trails unguided so if you can okay, get away right, with, yeah. if you've got good tracking good polar alignment and you can get away without guiding for three minutes you know fantastic i think you know that's good going i think typically you can go up to something like two minutes pretty much without star trails but i guess it's depending on where you're pointing yeah. and how good your alignment is well it, it depends on a couple of things one is your focal length uh, and your polar mm. alignment yeah, and all yeah, the stuff. but, but yeah, the other thing is the diameter of the scope so i mean you know mine's my, mine's got long long focal length but it's also got a very large diameter so i'm i can collect a lot of light in a very short time okay right yeah oh so, yeah the it comes back again to um not saturating everything i mean there might be the odd couple of stars in a frame that you're not too bothered about but if you want the color and the rest you've still got to limit what your exposure times are okay yeah that sounds sounds logical and while we are here uh you know i was talking about the planning tool which is there uh which you can use just for casual observing so it's you can basically, there's a wizard, which is just a screenshot. I can launch it and show you. But yeah, you can use a wizard and you can say, I want to see all the galaxies. I want to see only the planets, whatever. Mm -hmm. And then it will give you a list. So you can click on any of them. It will give you this nice little chart of uh, rice and uh, all those details. Then you can schedule it and then you can this planet you can add it to your session plan effectively can you add or, your horizon into that uh yeah horizon yes you can add the, what filters does it give you Pramod? like i said you're at the horizon so can you filter it so that it will only return say deep sky objects at a certain altitude um I no idea I'm okay sure. okay Where is it? It's pretty well, rare to find all of this all in one package, I've got to say. So it's it's very comprehensive. Well, going back to the previous point about long exposures, of course, it needs to change if you're doing narrowband filtering. So because you need you need longer exposures with narrowband. So whereas you might think yeah. of five minutes being sort of the dare I say your sort of typical maximum that you would do you might be thinking of five minutes as the minimum you might be doing with a narrow band yeah because you're, you're you're capturing less light so therefore yeah. you need more yeah so back, back to Trevor's point about it all comes down to what's the light gathering capability of the individual rig mm. I think the other thing is understanding the the emission type as well from for the uh, the object you're looking at um, one of the, you know, my early days, it was I didn't know whether it was a, was it whether it was, uh, you know, emitted more oxygen than hydrogen, or whether it was hydrogen or visible, um, and so I would be trying to visit, you know, I'd be trying to trying to image a hydrogen alpha nebula, for example, which is rich in hydrogen alpha with an O3 filter, and wondering why I wasn't seeing anything, um, but because that's an education thing and understanding, you know, understanding the, the the emissions types from the objects that you're trying to image. Yes, so it's not just a gung ho. I run all my no. filters. You might have to be uh, put a little more thought into your target. Yeah, absolutely. And that was just uh, me. Here is the question I guess amateur, you guys yeah. were asking. Uh, so that's location. To the gaseous nebulae, mm. right? It says two ninety eight objects found. Uh, it says, where do you want them? All over the sky, by constellation, in a rectangular region, in a circular region. If I go back, what does it do? Yeah, it asked me for RA limits, deck limits. And then it gives me all this from minimum altitude coverage, blah, 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 to which are observable only on this date. Wow. Does that answer your question, Nigel? 
Yes, it does. Yes. Yeah. And Basic. It's got magnitude as well. You can say I want only objects brighter than this. Yeah, because what you're doing here is you're gearing it around to the time of year and around your rig, what you're capable of viewing. There's no point you trying to look at something yeah. which you which is only covering three pixels um, yeah. and is, is, is behind the neighbor's house. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's perfect, yeah. It's basically... Your, yes, your... you can uh, define your horizon and instead of getting this flat line which I've got here, you can... It will give you a nice little yeah. shape there. For me, sometimes I think, what what is there up there tonight which I can which I can image? And, you know, I don't want to do this because I've, I've done it to death, you know, and I don't want to do that because I've done it to death. And it's nice to be able to say, look, just tell me what's up there, you know, which is magnitude, you know, 12 and great and above, you know, um, yeah. and above uh, this particular horizon line. Yeah, you can do it. Yep. Uh, what else is there? You can, like I said, you can execute the session plan. So it will basically give you the list and then you can make notes as and when you're finished viewing each of them. You can add observers. You can I haven't used any of those features, sorry. <laughs> Very capable package, I have to say, Perman, it's... Um... Yeah. The more, he uh, demonst the more you demonstrate, the, you know, the closer I'm getting to my drawer of Raspberry Pis. <laughs> <laughs> you got getting my juices flowing. <laughs> it's got quite a bit and... Like you guys, you know, just what I keep saying, right? You guys, I know so many of you keep saying, oh my God, my, uh, uh, what's that, uh, what's the term? I forget. Where uh, it just goes over the meridian. What's the term? Oh, meridian flip. 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 Meridian flip. Yeah, meridian flip. Right, where you guys say, oh my God, it got stuck. And in my case, right, so I've, Several times I've had to image something that's close to the meridian. And as soon as it goes over this side, right, it automatically flips and then it's back there. It does it. And I say, oh, this one is doing it. So there must be something more complex which you guys have got, which is not working. It's called setup. <laughs> I guess you guys have more components, isn't it? So mine is a simple stuff, so it doesn't have to do anything. It doesn't have to worry about a lot of things. Uh, I think there, no there domes, might be something no to this. do with the value of the kit as well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, for example, I know with uh, the uh, the Paramount <clears throat> and the Sky, you can set how far past Meridian it will go before it requires the, the flip or it hits a, a hard stop. And on my Tema, um, for the, my EM200, I can see the setting, but I've yet to get it to behave. And certainly when we were we were doing the Argus 2 project and um, the the satellite in question was so close to Meridian, it depended on how you set up as to whether the first thing it wants to do was a Meridian flip or not. Um, so it'd be interesting to have a look in this and see whether or not you can actually set a, a limit as to, is it going to do the Meridian flip at the Meridian? Or are you allowed like a, a, a 30 minute leeway? I think um, I, I have read on some of the bits of the software I use, but you have to be careful there's not a conflict between, because I go to mine through EQ Mod, yeah. but EQ Mod hasn't got a flip set, and then also the um, application has a flip set, and there can be a conflict sometimes. Yeah, you can get a similar thing with SG Pro between the mount having a flip capability mm. by itself yeah yeah, but, uh, yeah as long as you have the mount do its flip after the time yeah. that the control program does it's normally behaves so in sg pro it's exactly the same yeah. does it flip halfway through a sub or does no. it wait or does it wait for the sub to finish it waits well in sg pro it waits for sub to finish so if you set your time after for the meridian flip Say you set it for five minutes and you've got your sub length set to 10 minutes you've got a, you're running a risk aren't you of crashing into the mount I, I, I suspect it won't allow you to run the sub it yeah, won't run. if, it, if yeah. it knows it's too close it won't yeah, run okay. it yeah. yeah 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 you just yeah, get a longer pause from what i've seen right so for others doing it right so they said if they feel it's going to affect it they change this value so it's you've got 
tolerance around the meridian so it flips a lot before it reaches there and so on what does h what's h a excuse my ignorance our angle oh, our angle yeah. but you've got it set at degrees there anyway so yeah it's converted the, default, it's converting the default, hour default, angles yeah yeah, yeah. Hmm. it says capture and guiding will be suspended and resumed after the flip is complete yeah yep. and then it realigns as well so it does a and you've also got our angle limits there as well yeah yeah you lower right hand side correct yeah lower so right hand side of that display you've got another set yeah then you've got these so mm-hmm Hmm. Yes, there's quite a bit of stuff in there. You can auto park it at three in the morning every day or whatever. <laughs> yeah, so when you leave set and you wonder why you've lost half your imaging session. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Spend the next fortnight trying to figure it out. Yeah, because the one that I struggled with was, I think, something here. It was tick. And it was basically at the end of each uh, session, right? Or rather each uh, uh, schedule, effectively, I had ticked some little box here which said park the mount and yeah. stop. Yeah. So yeah. as soon as I took one set, it simply parked the mount, it shut down everything. And I said, I, said, I came back after about 15 minutes later and everything was shut down. I said, what the hell happened? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so trouble with the with park. Park normally means you've got a power cycle as well. Yeah, you, you got the same thing with um, you know, SDP Pro, haven't you? Where you can set the event to park at the end of a sequence. Yeah, you, you can. Remember, do you you can. remember to set it at the last sequence and <laughs> not the first. Well, first I never, sequence. I never do. I just, I, I never use park. Uh, All right. I, I send it back to zero because on my mount there are two different things. Yeah, I, I did the same thing as promo for my first sequence. I I, I set the park mm. event without realizing it's going to obviously park it before it completes the other yeah. remaining subs. You know, like I don't. <laughs> you, only, you only do that once, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you've got this button here, right? So the artificial horizon, right? So yeah. If you've defined your own artificial horizon, then it makes sure that it's risen above that artificial horizon before it actually attempts to image. Or if it goes beyond, it stops. Yeah. Uh, and this yeah. one is the tricky one, the twilight one, because sometimes I feel it's good enough to image, but it says, no, it's not a good time to image. So yeah. I will schedule something. It will say, no, I'm waiting. <laughs> I, I keep figuring out, what, why is it waiting? And then I find out that it's because of, it says twilight is not going to happen till 10 30 in the night or whatever it is it's figured for the day don't know where it gets the data from but yeah sometimes it can mess up your schedule well that will be astronomical darkness won't it it won't yeah, wait probably. till after twilight so. got, yeah mm. yeah that'll get that from your location information yeah yeah and time zone yeah excellent well very good I am impressed with it. I won't change at the moment, but I'm impressed with it. No, no, that's why I'm saying so. I'm not saying you guys need to change. It's just because it's, it's, yeah. So, for instance, if you want to use Nina, I mean, Nina must, I've looked at it. It's got all the bells and whistles. It's very similar, but it hasn't got the built-in Stellarium. Mm. But as long as it connects to another Stellarium or Stellarium can talk to Nina or something, then the two work together, right? So, uh, Well, I connect it to uh, uh, chart to see or so, yes. Hmm. But, uh, so, yeah. for instance, I think uh, CCD seal or whatever it is, I think hmm. they've got, it supports indie drivers. So you can hmm. connect that and do the stuff. Uh, and this is the indie control panel. So effectively, for each device, you've got a whole bunch of parameters you can configure here. So for the CCD, you've got the image settings, which is where you effectively tell what camera it is and what's the size, pixels, all that stuff. Your uh, images, whether you want it raw, 
compressed, all that. Mm -hmm. Set it all up here. Mm. Yeah, there's a whole bunch of stuff there. So and how much is how much is a pie? 50 quid. 50 quid and a box, what 20, 10, 20? Let's put it in. Five quid. Five quid and then equals so you know for literally 50, 60 quid. Um, yeah. you can remotely control your setup. That's very good. It's very good value. If you've got a 3D printer, Keith, which you have, then mm -hmm. you can print your own case. Uh, yeah, I, exactly. I can when I read 56 quid, I think, filament. for this one. Uh, Come on, how, how long, how long, sorry, how long would, how long would you say it took you from getting your Raspberry Pi understanding about this software? Did it take you from, from, from that, from that standpoint to actually getting yourself up and running comfortably? Uh, understanding this software took me a bit of time. Uh, obviously, every time I go into it, I discover new features yeah, and yeah. so on. But Raspberry Pi, it probably I bought it, uh, and then over a weekend I configured it. So that's pretty good, then, isn't it? For, for yeah. going from going from nothing to being fairly complimentous in a very short period of time as well. Yeah. Because a lot of people, obviously, if they're not technical, they can be put off by some of these things, you know, with the mm. configuration and stuff. And so, looking at it from a very, from a, from a, from a very basic perspective, you know, how long would it take somebody with no knowledge to become in fairly confident and fluent with the usage of both the Pi, setting the Pi up, um, installing the software, and then utilizing the software? Easy. Um, if, if it's a week or two, installing the Pi yeah. is the easy part. That's very good. Yep. And like I said. The simple way is obviously you could do this, right? So that's as probably. Yeah, I, I, what I find with these things is installing the software is one thing. Getting yeah. it running, getting it running though, <laughs> is another. Or getting it running with your. It, it with just your... runs, right? Yeah. So I haven't had to do anything with this. So, so with this this way, you're installing an operating system and the application software Correct. all in one go. Everything mm. is there, and yeah. if you see here, right, it comes pre-installed with K stars. Oh wow! Uh, HD two, uh, OA capture, um, and a few more. I think it comes with Astap. It comes with a few other things. So you didn't have to configure. So or, or for no, your drive, none of this. I hadn't. I didn't. For your, for your drivers, thing. you just. Yeah, so your drivers, you just selected the camera and that was it. You didn't have to install That's anything. That's it. Fantastic. Okay. So if I run cool. case stars from here, because I run it from my laptop, right? So if I run case stars from here, so that's what it will do. So if I say, okay, I want a new set of configurations. I say, okay, my Astro gear, fine. Add it. I've, this is what I've done previously. So I put the EQ mod mount. I've got this, uh, the whole bunch of mounts I can choose. I can add the CCD. I can add the guider. I can add a focuser. I can add the filter. I can add the AO whatever this is. I don't know what this is. I can add a Ad dome. Adaptive optics. Yeah, I don't know what that means, but yeah. Don't worry. <laughs> you, you can't buy one and they're too expensive even if you could. <laughs> uh, same here. So I can't afford a dome at this point in time. So I could put a dome simulator and I get thought, away with it. Yeah. I and thought pretend you got one. is a fairly reasonable one, Trevor. Well, sorry, what was that? I oh. thought for Stun Starlight Express have a little AO unit. Oh, was, really? Uh, it was not outrageous. It was expensive, but not outrageously expensive. Yeah, they're the oh, only okay. uh, amateur level ones that have done it, I think. Okay. Then been this out. is it's the one that I was years. fiddling with. I said, ah, what's this? <laughs> and then I started and asking. That, that was the question. rat hole you went down last week. <laughs> yeah, that's the one. <laughs> Open weather map. That's where I went and got stuck. Okay. okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. I understand. And then you've got a whole bunch of auxiliary stuff which you can attach to this. Oh, like all those Arduino toys. Yeah, you've got <laughs> Arduino toys. You can. 
Interesting. That might even support the, the focuser that I built with an Arduino. Yeah. yeah. Why it doesn't? I don't know what each of these you can effectively have three of these. So yeah. So from what point, of those. just select that an Arduino focuser and auxiliary one. Yeah. That's, that's it. That was the question. Uh that's it, yes. Oh no, that was no the Arduino. That's it, the Arduino. Arduino. Where is it? That one? Yeah. That's the one, yeah. Yeah, that's it. You mm -hmm. save it, and then if it's connected, and you start it up, you'll get a nice little time for it. Does it do um, uh, flat boxes, you know, flat panels? I have no idea. Yeah, I just... Must be there somewhere. Because, uh, you know, I'd have, to be... I'd have to come up under the auxiliary set. Yeah, I was going to say. Yeah. Top, top. Let's see what options we had under the auxiliary tab. See what else was under there. Mm. I can't remember the make of the flip flap that uh, I've got. Maybe yeah, easier scroll, to find scroll, on the website. Isn't scroll, it? scroll down a bit. Oh, there you go. You've got Allen Allen Tack remote dust cover. It's probably it's in that sort of ballpark, isn't it? Mm. Where are you seeing? This one, yes, possibly. Yeah, there's a flip panel, see, yeah, flip flat, flip, it says. flip flat. That's right. that's one of the um common ones, yeah. But um, yeah, so obviously a bit of background reading to find out. That list, is obviously, that list is obviously longer than that. I mean, you've got down to you only got as far as C, as far as C. Oh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> it's it's, zoom, it's the, off the bottom the, of the screen, yeah. The Arduino um flat panel that I made was based on that um flip flat. So it's a okay, flip flat. I just saw it at the top. You just gonna you, you're gonna ask flip flap if you go up a couple of rows. Oh, yeah, yeah, flip flap, yeah, yeah, yeah. flip flap. You've got flip flap, you've got flip man. Yeah, flip manual. Mm. Yeah. Focus links, focus simulators. Uh, we wanted to see if, if there are rotators, right? I don't know what they're called. It was a Pegasus, wasn't that the... Um... Yeah, I was going to yeah. say Pegasus. Pegasus, Pegasus, Pegasus Flat there's... Master, you've got yeah. Focus uh, PPBA, you've got PPBM. Hmm. That's the rotator. Yeah. Mm. There's plenty of stuff. The there. Falcon's a rotator, isn't it? The Pegasus Falcon. Yeah. I'm sure no, it's also got there, a Pegasus Flat I know Master as well. Several people have mm. got all these devices. So mm. there are people who have got multiple uh, observatories linked to this damn software. So and they use you've got plane wave here. You've yeah. Got... I bet I better not tell Ron that. Yeah, we want no change. <laughs> Has Ron got his? Um, no, not yet. They delivered it to the wrong house on uh, right way instead of or right close instead of right way. Uh, it's pathetic. It is. What's he ordered? Oh, he's, he's sent, he sent. had to send his um, ME two back for repair when he bounced it oh um yeah. so uh, it, and it's it spent weeks and weeks and weeks um going around europe and back and forward and back and oh, forward, right. uh, okay you know Could sounds this expensive be it? Sell it tech 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 yeah that's that looks that's like a make, a make of them yeah yeah You've got the so, yeah, you've got simulator. All sorts. look at that you've still got a true tech filter wheel yeah i was just saying that yeah 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 excellent Mm. So, yeah, yeah, great stuff. We can try, we can try adding the there simulator well. and see what it does. <laughs> I never bought it, so yeah, I don't know what this does. Sky Safari that would be interesting. Yeah. Well, that's a, a tablet phone app, isn't it? So, yeah. yeah, but I don't know how it interfaces, right? So, mm. if you've got um it can through wi-fi yeah. no, but i mean 
if you've got cage stars running here and then I choose this as an auxiliary device, what does it do? Well, presumably, it'll replace K stars with Sky Safari. Hmm. Uh, and if you happen so. to use Sky Safari on your mobile phone or or yeah. you know other tablet, mm. maybe it just makes it more integrated. Mm. It also looks as though you've got shell yak um, spectroscopes there as well, a couple up or something similar. Yeah. yeah. Oh. There you go. One for JHB. No, Ooh, JVH. Sort of sounded wrong when I said it. <laughs> Ooh. Yeah, oh, he's listening, the look. There you go, see? Especially for you there, John. Yeah. Hmm. Fabulous. Well, thanks very much, um, Pramod. Really, really interesting. Not a problem. Has anyone else got any questions? <laughs>